Hello there. This is Lost Chord of the Little Platoon speaking to you from, well, the present, obviously, but also from the future. Because the video you're about to watch is one from the distant past. I kicked off the media coverage that's come to define this channel back in November of 2021 with a short video on Star Trek Discovery. I watched it, I hated it, I was annoyed, and I thought I'd vent my spleen. That video proved popular, so I resolved to do a whole critique series on it. Part 1 of that series came out in April of 2022, Part 2 came out in May. Part 3 was due to come out in June, and then July, and then August, and September, and so on. But various things got in the way. The channel blew up. There was much more that I wanted to cover, and so production on this series just kind of ceased. Yet part 3 was almost so close it was almost ready to go. I had about 20 minutes of footage left to lay. And in the months since, I've thought of coming back to it, but I've been put off. Because, you see, I think I've learned quite a lot in the year I've spent making these videos. The production quality now is, I would say, much better than it was then. I've got a much better microphone. I sound rather different. And I was loath to upload something that fell beneath what I ventured to say have become my standards. And yet I do hate incompleteness. It feels somehow wrong not to finish things off. So I thought... Since my three and a half hour avatar video is still a little way from being ready, I take a few extra hours, get this one done, and upload it to fill the content gap. All of which is a long-winded way of saying, this video might not be that good, but I offer it to you now regardless. If you're ready, follow me into the Retardis. We are going back to the midsummer of 2022. Hello and welcome to the third and final installment of our critique of Star Trek Discovery. We've nearly made it. I joked in the last episode in this series that you'd have around three days to watch it before CBS filed their umpteenth vexatious copyright claim on it, and in the event it took them all of two hours. Needless to say, the claim was overturned on review. Again. But if the current trend continues, this video will have been banned around two days before it's uploaded, using one of those bullshit time travel plot lines New Trek subjects us to whenever it's run out of canonical material to wreck. Of course, we can hope that this time will be different, and steps have been taken to improve our odds, hence the gap between this video and the last one for which my apologies. But then again, this is CBS we're talking about, so I recommend you watch it while you can. Before we begin, a word on my approach to this video. While part one skimmed over events we had already covered in previous videos and focused more on what the critical drinker calls the message, and part two then plumbed the depths of what passed for the plot of episodes eight through ten, my aim with this video is to combine these two approaches, rogering the plot of episodes ten through thirteen with a decent amount of vigor, but also interrogating the moral, philosophical, and especially the political message as well. In an ideal world, this last could be abstracted into a The Politics Of style video, of the type that would have been possible were we critiquing pretty much any old Trek show, which, as we've covered in previous installments, was indeed always political, albeit not in the way the people who trot out this asinine line in defense of Star Trek Discovery mean when they say it. We could have talked more about liberal universalism and its entailments about the political economy of the Federation, about the place of democracy in a pseudo-utopia. We could have asked what its underlying assumptions were and then debated them, explored how the show used the dialectic to illustrate the two moral or ethical contradictions its plot was designed to unwind. What we would not have had to do is devote much, if any, time to what said old Trek show had to say about specific and contemporaneous political policy questions or the positions it had taken with respect to living politicians. Star Trek writers once understood that, if these were the questions they had their audience arguing over, they would have failed in their duty as Star Trek writers. The fact Star Trek Discovery leaves us no choice but to argue over these questions is, then, a damning indictment of its writers and creators. Nevertheless, it is, I've always thought anyway, important that when you're criticizing political partisanship in art, you should avoid straying into political partisanship yourself, or at least avoid it to the greatest extent possible. 
As George Orwell wrote in his essay The Frontiers of Art and Propaganda, in the context of literary criticism, this is not a peaceful age and it is not a critical age. In the Europe of the last ten years, literary criticism of the older kind, criticism that is really judicious, scrupulous, fair-minded, treating a work of art as a thing of value in itself, has been next door to impossible. He goes on in that same essay to explain how literary and artistic criticism moved from an ostensibly pure and apolitical analysis of art for art's sake to a period immediately before and then throughout World War II where all the great artists and writers, he mentions W. H. Auden, Stephen Spender, Louis McNeese and especially Edward Upward, were consciously and didactically political, concerned with how their work would influence politics as well as how it would be read and judged politically. Upward in particular presages the aesthetic period we now find ourselves in, given that he believed a book could only be good to the extent it was, in George Orwell's words, Marxist in tendency. Ultimately, when judging the worth of this new political awakening, Orwell's conclusion was paradoxical. He would criticize excess in political writing while at the same time thinking it was probably for the best that the new school of criticism had done away with the idea that any book could be entirely free of politics. All art is propaganda after all, whether it was designed to be so or not. In a separate essay, however, and I regret I can't recall which, he did draw a distinction that I'm going to invoke here in my own defense, that being between political art and the politics of art. The writers of Star Trek Discovery are creating political art, which, when it's excessive, as it certainly is in Discovery's case, ends up as a parasitic relationship, the politics sapping all life from the art that is its host. My approach in countering that, which will be on display when we come to the section on Stacey Abrams' cameo, is to write about the politics in that art without, I hope, taking too political a line myself, certainly without taking any partisan position that would, ultimately, undermine the whole point of this critique. Attacking one politician for their actions, especially for their hypocrisy, does not necessarily lead one to endorse any other politician. So when we do come to that section, I hope it'll be clear that I am not attacking a Democrat as a Republican or a progressive as a conservative. As I've said in my previous videos, I am neither a Republican nor a conservative. Rather, my aim will be to show how her inclusion elevates the politics of Star Trek Discovery at the expense of Star Trek Discovery. I uploaded this excerpt as a separate video some time ago, so if you've already seen that and you don't want to relive it, you'll find timestamps in the description and you should be able to navigate past it with relative ease. Unless you're here for the premiere, obviously, in which case, once again, Strap yourselves in. Before then, in any case, we have an awful lot of nonsense in the plot to go through, and we'll try and keep that light and reasonably entertaining. Anyway, that dialectical foreplay dispensed with, and now that we are sufficiently lubed up, let's get fucking. We left the show with the Discovery using space testicles to pass through the galactic barrier and into extragalactic space in search of the Collectors, whom they must stop before their second Death Star Minecraft machine reaches the Alpha Quadrant and blows up Earth and Navarre. Episode 10 begins 29 hours before the second Death Star reaches Earth. The Discovery travels to a dead planet next to a star orbited by Dyson rings, all of which we see and it looks lovely. But for the visually impaired, Burnham also narrates it. There are, famously, two broad approaches to any work of narrative fiction. Show not tell is generally preferred, but it would be wrong to dismiss the tell not show approach entirely. Old Trek, for example, was very much tell not show storytelling, largely because they lacked the budget and the technology to utilize flashy effects in action sequences. And there is a direct comparison here because the Discovery is not the only ship to have had to travel through wormholes or subspace rifts. Picard's Enterprise did it, and it's a brilliant example of the tell-not-show approach, because we see practically nothing of the ship and its surroundings in the entire sequence, and all the events, all the peril, are experienced by Remove, the camera barely if ever leaving the bridge. Yet it manages to elevate the tension sublimely. The scene is gripping, the dialogue and the actors' performances leave you in no doubt as to the danger they are in. And it doesn't need explosions and space-borne panoramas to show us what this threat actually looks like. Discovery, by contrast, does have the budget to show, and it shows us a lot. But it doesn't have a high enough opinion of its audience to assume that it can get away without telling us as well. Discovery's approach is generally show and tell, which is fitting for a series with all the emotional intelligence of a girl in primary school. This opening scene is a case in point. 
Not many people know that there was a sequel in film to Arthur Clarke and Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey. 2010, The Year We Make Contact, isn't a terrible film by any means. We've reviewed it over at Mr. Brown Alliance, link in the description. But whereas Kubrick's direction in 2001 is profound and even revolutionary in its realism, relying on silence for its atmosphere and understanding that explanation can actually be less informative, 2010 junks that for a much more conventional approach, filling the silence with music and voiceovers from Amity Island's Chief Brody. Silence in space is profound, it is also realistic. Silence creates a sense of mystery and awe about the realistic. It allows us to fully appreciate what we're seeing. Having a voiceover explaining what we're seeing deprives us of that wonder. This scene with the Discovery approaching the dead planet could have been very impressive. And actually, let's do a quick experiment. Compare and contrast. Our only hope is the dead planet we're orbiting right now. It was a gas giant until a series of massive asteroids hit and burned the gas away. Its star is surrounded by Dyson rings made from the same rare material as the DMA controller. And my gut tells me there has to be a connection. Now, that is slightly overdone, using the same Ligeti piece 2001 made famous, but you get the idea. Maybe I'm an outlier, maybe I have weird taste, but I know which of these two approaches works better and which tells me more, and I'm prepared to die… Uh, no, actually I'm not prepared to die on this hill, because we are still talking about Star Trek Discovery, and the only way I'm dying on that hill is if it kills me, which… well, it might. They have a truly, truly cringe slow-mo hallway walk. Then we cut away to Book and morally dubious character, who are hiding in their ship behind an asteroid plotting their next move. You'll recall that they managed to blow up the first Death Star, but morally dubious character was unable to get the power source he needs to jump into another dimension to rejoin heavily implied boyfriend because, it transpired, the power source was on the other side of the wormhole and in the collector's space, so they now need to find their way in without being detected by the Discovery. Their plan is to do a Millennium Falcon and hide from the Discovery by attaching themselves to the Discovery. But whereas Star Wars was happy just to show us and so allow us to appreciate Han Solo's cunning, Discovery has to tell us exactly what is happening at length again and make the whole thing much more convoluted. The Discovery crew say their goodbyes in the hangar and the President of Navarre mentions how very urgent this mission is. So very urgent, they must already feel its urgency, and she cannot possibly tell them how urgent it is without telling them what they already feel to be the profound urgency of their mission. The last time we had this line, most of the rest of the episode was taken up by a side quest and flashbacks, so this bodes well. And fuck me, but they drag the same scene out unnecessarily, with a protracted debate between Jesus and diverse female space marine over the merits of their plan which is to go down to the dead planet and look for cultural clues that'll help them communicate with the collectors. Diverse female space marine is much more of the opinion that they should just blow up the collectors, though we've just had this debate and we just saw it pan out and it didn't work and we don't need to have it again. Get on with it! On their way down, Gay Doctor says it's good to know the laws of physics still apply outside the Milky Way, which is, I mean, yeah? Has anyone ever suggested they don't? They're between galaxies, not between dimensions. They've not crossed into another universe. The laws of physics are universal, show. On the planet's surface, Saru starts tripping balls for some reason, and they discover some bones the size of small streets, relics of this planet's long-dead inhabitants that we are led to believe, because, obviously, have some connection to the Collectors. Then we flip back to Book and Morally Dubious Character, who repeat the same lives versus feelings conversation we had in the last episode, and indeed the same one we've had in some form in almost every episode since Season 1, which adds precisely nothing to what we already know are the stakes. Having attached themselves to the Discovery, they hop aboard, undetected. 
Back on the planet, the team are doing some on-the-spot archaeology with the bones, and then they scan the ground and realize they are standing in a kind of graveyard, which I guess adds a bit of mystery. But once again, we have to mention this show's problem with pacing. There is a good deal of potential in this setup, and it could have made for a superb episode or even a two-part episode, allowing time for mystery and suspense and discovery. But because we've spent almost all season fighting off various galactic threats and hopping between life or death battles and conundrums, there just isn't time to devote much more than a few minutes to the discovery part of this episode, which again has the effect of making the sciencing they do seem implausibly quick and convenient and magical. Saru is still tripping balls. Jesus asks him about his feelings, and he says he feels the coming of death, and he's not the only one. But if that is indeed what's coming, it's the first actually meaningful feelings conversation this show has had since possibly ever, in fact. Back aboard the Discovery, we have an entirely unnecessary conversation between President Clinton and new Asian doctor over his lack of tact which has been invented in this episode, because it's important that he doesn't make people feel stressed, don't you know? They're literally on a mission to save the galaxy from a Death Star. You might think stress is kind of normal? Maybe if they had a bit more stress, they would be displaying a bit more of the urgency they told us they were all possessed with. Anyway, this scene accomplishes less than nothing. It just eats up time and distracts from the plot. Just stop doing this show. You've got a very interesting subplot playing out elsewhere and you're taking time away from it to do this. After yet more super irrigation, we finally get back to the planet where the team has entered the giant building filled with paralyzed jellyfish. Saru is still tripping balls at the prospect of imminent death. It's a very bad trip. And then Gay Doctor begins tripping balls as well. This curious development is interrupted as we again cut back to the Discovery, where Book and morally dubious character are sneaking around, and they decide the best thing to do is to ask RC diverse female space marine from earlier to help them because it's established, it was established a few minutes ago anyway, that she is indeed RC and skeptical of the merits of this mission, even though she's just seen her own preferred alternative go up in smoke. Zora, the ship's computer, despite being a hyper-advanced sentient lifeform with access to all the ship's systems, including sensors, either hasn't noticed that Book and Morally Dubious character are wandering around the corridors in plain view, or else it just doesn't think it's worth mentioning. Back on the planet, Jesus is now tripping balls as well. They're sharing visions. They decide the best way to figure out what and why is to retrace their steps for a few minutes. Meanwhile, the show has remembered that it pays Tig Notaro far too much money for the amount of effort she dedicates to it. She is back for the first time in not long enough. She has a mother-daughter chat with Adira, and again there are hints of good character development here, or squandered character development here at any rate, and it's all far too late. It's a shame the writers really don't know what to do with these people, how to pace them, or where to place them so they don't completely break the tone and the mood of their surroundings which is unfortunately what happens whenever Tig Notaro is in the scene. The show is also stretching the gay parenthood thing too thin. We've had a semblance of this sub arc between Adira, gay doctor and gay scientist, now we have it with Tig Notaro as well. There is, again, the semblance of a good idea here. It plays on an archetype that is an archetype for a reason. Young people who are gay or bi often get the vast majority of their knowledge of this important part of their character, basically knowledge of themselves, from other people, being either reluctant to get it or prevented from getting it from their parents. If you're lucky, I was for example, you find yourself embraced into a tightly knit and supportive community including people older than you who've been through all this before. There can be a lot of intergenerational support, and that is genuinely warming. I'm morally certain that's the trope this show is playing on here, but once again, having left itself so little time in which to do it, and having made every character involved in it as shallow as a tick box, it just doesn't play out the way it's supposed to and it feels rushed and contrived. Back on the planet, David Bowie's sister is the only one not hallucinating. They deduce that their hallucinations have something to do with some dust they stepped in earlier. David Bowie's sister does some magic trick, I mean science, and the problem is solved. Rather than interrogate the point and purpose of the dust and the visions it showed them, they talk about their feelings for a bit and go off for a stroll. Back aboard the Discovery, this show is jumping around like anything. Morally dubious character Solid snakes his way into engineering while Book accosts diverse female space marine, 
who betrays this show's complete disregard for concepts of duty and authority by making her own feelings of discontent supersede her job and her position. Book does some exposition, diverse female space marine thinks he has a point, they promise to stay in touch. They've shared maybe one scene together before? This level of trust should not exist, and if it is so easy to gain, she should not be a military leader. Then again, nobody in this show should be in the positions they're in. Back on the planet, they find some collector cocoons, which leads them to infer that the collectors value their children. Like, basically every sentient species we're aware of. But Jesus decides to get high on dust again anyway, so she can learn more about what loving children is like, since this concept appears to be alien to her. Because she's, I guess, too busy pursuing her career. They have some more character moments with David Bowie's sister, because the writers realize she's basically been a husk from season one. Same with every character, in fact, who isn't Jesus or Book or morally dubious character. It is staggering that we've reached this part in the show, and this is the first time we've had to know anything about any of these ancillary characters. I don't even know David Bowie's sister's name. Anyway, does all of this hasty character development mean she's going to die? It's a pretty classic lazy writing trope, and one Disco has gone in for before. If you're about to kill someone off, you need to make the audience care about them, and if you've not been competent enough to do that over the course of four seasons, you have to rush it at the close. I know at least one of our fans likes Gundam. A friend and I binged most of the series many years ago, and it did become something of a private meme. If a random new character is introduced as a love interest of one of the main or ancillary cast, you could guarantee that one or both of them would die within two episodes. It is lazy, sometimes it does work, sometimes it's just funny. And Discovery could capture any one of these emotions if it decides to kill off anyone it's suddenly decided to lumber with feelings, but because it is Discovery, it will probably ruin the meme and with it that inexplicably pivotal moment in my childhood. Anyway, they reason that somewhere in these feelings they're all having is something that'll help them communicate with the collectors, though they know not what. If this show makes feelings the key that unlocks first contact, I might have to scream. Tig Notaro stumbles across morally dubious character while he's sleuthing around, and registers all the surprise you'd expect from someone whose specialty is in looking like she really doesn't give a fuck what's happening on this show, or indeed why she's here. The away team has another feelings conversation on the shuttle back to the ship. I know it's been said countless times, but you really can't overstate how utterly absurd this meta is, and how utterly absurd is its deployment. It's just absurd, it is absurd, there is no other word for it. Think how much time has been taken up by these almost entirely unnecessary and inconsequential conversations over the last four seasons. Their total runtime probably amounts to two seasons of its own. That's a huge amount of time that could have been spent on profitable things, like actual character development and world building, and properly fleshed out plots and coherent storylines and action sequences that have a properly established context. But instead, the writers have to make sure characters cannot go more than five minutes without another therapy session, where they rip off the same old themes and say, do, and add nothing new, nothing relevant, nothing to justify the time they're taking up. Finally, though, finally someone demonstrates a bit of good sense and spots the problem I highlighted, god knows how long ago, in the first three episodes of this show after the setup was made clear, Saru posits that first contact with the collectors might fail because they already know what their Death Star machine is doing and they don't care. Yeah, well done, it's been blindingly obvious for most of this season. But better late than never. Back aboard ship, gay scientists say as they sent some of those drones they picked up in season 2 I think? But that only pop up now when their presence won't irrevocably break the plot to scan more of the planet's surface, and that begs the question, why didn't they do that in the first place? Why didn't they just send the drones instead? Why haven't they sent the drones in all the countless scenarios over the course of this season where it would have been the safer and more sensible thing to do? But never mind, President of Navarre and Saru go make sweet, sweet feelings discourse on the holodeck. Jesus and gay scientist have a feelings talk, while Book spies on Jesus in her room, and that's not at all a creepy thing to do. Adira and David Bowie's sister have a feelings chat, they just keep fucking coming. Jesus and Gay Doctor have a feelings chat, one scene after another, just make it stop, Jesus, 
Christ show. Does anyone actually watch this and enjoy it? It's just... Uh, uh, uh. And the episode ends back on Bookship, where it turns out morally dubious character has taken Tignataro hostage. A revelation that has all the severity sucked from it by the fact it is Tignataro, and she doesn't give a fuck. And so we crash into this season's penultimate episode. This one opens with a my god, it's full of stars moment as they all look awestruck at the hyperspace field or whatever it's called. The thing that's shielding the collectors from the universe outside. The thing powered by the Boronite that their Death Star Minecraft machine is mining. And so the reason all of this is happening. They've been calling the collectors using conventional comms for a while, but the collectors are blanking them so they decide they need to revert to a contingency plan. Oh no, I... Well, I said I'd scream, so I suppose it's it's gonna have to happen. Oh, no, God! No! 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 The show is actually doing it. Star Trek Discovery is going peak. Star Trek Discovery, you thought it had been at many peaks before. No, this is its peak. It's assuming its ultimate form. They are going to communicate with the collectors using fucking feelings. <laughs> Apparently they've collected hydrocarbons from the surface of the dead planet, and these represent feelings. They are going to shoot feelings at the hyperfield, by attaching those feelings to the drones and then throwing the drones at the hyperfield to piss the feelings on the hyperfield. That they are literally spraying feelings on a wall. I'm not joking. I am genuinely not joking. This is a thing that is happening. People wrote this. The writers finally remember that they gave the ship's computer feelings as well and that they've done nothing with that apparently significant developments since, so they remember to mention that Zora has doubts about this mission. The fact this is the first time Zora has had any significant role in the plot since that entire episode devoted to giving her feelings begs the question, why did they bother? What was the point? What did that achieve? Why go to the trouble of making a new character out of the computer, in the most cringe-making way imaginable, if they were just going to forget about it for the rest of the season, because it doesn't impact the story. This is a waste of time show. On book ship, Tignataro is still being dry as a Jawa's vagina, so they feed her licorice to shut her up. What an impactful scene. Discovery sends the drones to piss feelings on the wall, and then we get what is absolutely 100% a reference to the abyss, as water tentacles emerge to swallow first the drones and then the Discovery. Once inside the hyperfield, morally dubious character scans for the Death Star core, finds it on the other side of the collector's space. Tignataro blandly watches Morally Dubious' character doing something morally dubious, then rigs up a wrist computer of some kind, but she's struggling to get it to work properly. Anyway, she shouldn't have it, because she's been taken hostage, and you do not let hostages keep their bloody iPhones on them. Gay scientist, gay doctor, and Zora, you guessed it, have a feelings talk. The First Contact Committee, meanwhile, has a mildly more useful and interesting discussion speculating on the actions and motives of the Collectors, even though we posed these questions in our review half a season ago, because they are so damn obvious. Jesus decides they should give the Collectors a gift of Boronite that they just happen to have lying around. Meanwhile, Tignataro and Book have a feelings talk. Meanwhile, Jesus and diverse female space marine have a feelings talk. Then they all get summoned to the shuttle bay because a life form is approaching. The universal translator isn't working, but the organism, seemingly made of gas because nobody could be bothered to animate it, pisses more feelings at them, which they decode as a string of... well... feelings, obviously. I really can't believe this is happening. Having done the abyss, now we get a riff on close encounters. It turns out feelings add inflection to the collector's language, which is otherwise comprised of light signals. If they do music as well, Steven Spielberg should really sue. It might actually bring an end to this absurd show. Despite the clear progress being made, Book convinces diverse female space marine, 
to follow through with their own contingency plan of blowing shit up once morally dubious character has got whatever he's working on working. And again, even though we've already had this and it didn't work, Jesus and her disciples continue trying to figure out what the light show is all about. And it's at this point I realize we're halfway into the penultimate episode of this season and next to nothing has actually happened. Once upon a time, you might have devoted much if not all of an episode to the first contact with the collectors being as it is an incredibly momentous thing. And then you could have left it on a cliffhanger. It could have been one of the old serialized two-parters you'd see from The Next Generation or Voyager. But all of Discovery is serialized. And that places much more importance in the proper pacing and placing of plot and events. Because mistakes in a serialized show compound themselves. Wasting a few minutes in an earlier episode can result in half an episode lost later on in the run. This season got things badly wrong. It now has to try and balance two concepts or devices that are each large enough to deserve their own two-parter, first contact with the collectors and a big final conflict. It has to cram these things together because it hasn't paced itself properly earlier in its run, because the writers are incompetent. They wasted all their time on feelings talks, on big stakes in each episode and on setting up characters they have literally no use for. Speaking of the big final conflict, Morally dubious character was an idiot and did all his calculations while Tignataro was watching so she knows exactly what magic spell, I mean science, he was doing. And she takes Book aside to tell him that if they go through with morally dubious character's plan to remove the core of the Death Star while the Death Star is still running, everything will explode. Why? I, I don't know. If you actually had to write an explanation for it, you'd realize it makes no sense. So the writers lied all explanation and just hope you won't notice. Back on Discovery, our mashup of Arrival and Close Encounters continues. Asian Doctor is brilliant at maths, lol, and is discerning patterns in the Collector's attempts at communicating. The show then, inexplicably, takes time out for, uh, I mean, I'll give you three guesses, yeah you're right, a feelings talk between Jesus and Saru about Saru's feelings for the President of Navarre. We've now reached the point where Discovery is having feelings talks about people's feelings for other characters and how they feel about them. There are 20 minutes of this episode left. You do not have time for this show. And there's a problem here too. The Collectors are a hyper-advanced form of life. Yet it's the Discovery crew that has to put in all the effort to communicate and to decode their language. It's even explained that the reason the Collectors aren't initially forthcoming is that they might not even realize that Discovery is a sentient form of life or inhabited by same. Despite it being a spaceship and clearly artificial, despite it having traveled outside its own galaxy, Despite it, or those very close to it, having used advanced technology to blow up the Death Star, despite it having sent drones to communicate, despite them having attempted to communicate in the first place, and showed all the signs of, well, okay, admittedly not intelligent life, because no one in this show would pass the cheering test, but intelligent-ish life, enough at least surely to pique the interest of a hyper-intelligent life form like the Collectors. But we're supposed to believe that the Collectors are so advanced, they have actually become more stupid. It's a nonsense, of course, because we've already had an episode on their old homeworld which proved they built things and used technology and resembled a conventional flesh and blood and science civilization, which they have transcended. Transcended does not mean you forget everything you were before. Transcended does not mean everything that got you to the point of transcendence just disappears in a, a plot hole. For their present character to make sense, we have to assume not only that they've become so advanced they've shed their physical form, which is a fairly old sci-fi trope, but that in doing so they have entirely forgotten everything about their past. And all the knowledge they once had, and all the science, and all the reasoning and inductive and deductive faculties the much less advanced crew of the Discovery are here showing. We have to believe they have become essentially gassy space whales, and this constitutes progress to a higher form of intelligence this is oh, it's just so incredibly silly. Book confronts morally dubious character about the nasty, nasty lies he's told, and his plans to blow up everyone and everything inside the hyperfield. And actually, not only is feelings the hinge for the other plot, it's the hinge here as well. Because, it's heavily suggested, morally dubious character is blinded now by his feelings, which is the only reason he has become, effectively, a genocidal maniac. And bear in mind, but the first we really saw of his motives, the reasons for his feelings, was two episodes ago, in flashback scenes that just distracted 
from what we were told was a much more urgent mission for our main cast. This is Rise of Skywalker level writing. This is just a mess. This is almost panicky. How do you introduce, properly introduce, your main villain in the last three episodes of your entire season? So we're just supposed to accept that this totally random revelation has primed him to become a genocidaire? That he's so desperate to get back that he'll kill anyone and anything to do it, even though he hasn't done that up until this point? You could have built his character up over the course of the entire season. Drip feed information. Take more time with him. Explore him some more. Have feelings conversations that are actually relevant to the plot and his character. There is the germ of a good idea in here. Desperation moves man to all manner of sins. And it also invites our sympathy and even our empathy. You could have created a really compelling and sympathetic villain from all this raw material. But Discovery didn't even introduce the guy until midway through its season. Just barely hinted at the most basic form of his motives in the second third and only got around to showing us anything meaningful about his character as it concerns his actions now, five fucking minutes ago. Honestly, these writers should be sacked and driven out of the industry. This is just hackery. But then again, the industry rewards pure hackery. How else could Bad Robot exist? And so I'm sure we can expect them to be working on big Disney products in the near future. Perhaps doing unspeakable things to the corpses of Star Wars and the MCU. Anyway, he seems to have taken control of Book's ship now. Because remember, he can do that. He installed a brand spanking new automated defense system in mere seconds off screen between episodes without Book noticing, despite Book being all of three feet away from him at the time. Meanwhile, Discovery and the Collectors are doing math at each other. And then we get a reference to, well, name any sci-fi that features strange spheres. Arthur Clarke's Time's Eye comes to mind, and I think The City and the Stars has one. Michael Crichton's Sphere. Hell, Destiny 2 and Independence Day Resurgence have mysterious spheres as integral parts of what passes for their plot. And so does Star Trek Discovery in Season 2. Am I saying Star Trek Discovery is derivative? Damn right I am, it's derivative as hell, even of itself because doing new things requires thought, and thought is the mortal foe of this writing team. The sphere they're trying to communicate with forms a door. Then we hard cut back to Book's ship as his own ship attacks him under orders from morally dubious character, who I guess isn't morally dubious anymore, and the automated defense system is evidently not automated anymore either, which poses questions about his earlier motives and actions. He said he couldn't save the Discovery shuttle from the system a few episodes back because it was automated. So either he was lying then, in which case he's always been a murderous genocidal maniac and has had no character development at all, and so the desperation cannot explain his motives, or at least anything we've learned since that episode can't explain his new motives, or else he's had character development, but that rests on the writers just kind of forgetting the setup for the previous episode's big threat. Tignataro watches on with an expression on her face which, well she has an expression now, that's character progression. President Clinton volunteers to enter the sphere, and she also volunteers Jesus and Saru, but the Asian mathematician, is there any other kind, stays behind in case he has to do more maths. Diverse female space marine declines the invitation because she's evil now, and the president of Navarre accepts it. For some reason, they decide Zora shouldn't come, because they literally have no idea how to make this sentient computer character work in their story. Then, we take time out so Jesus and Saru can have a feelings talk. I have a working theory, which is that every character in this show has to take time out to tell the audience exactly what they're feeling and why, because none of the actors in the show are capable of expressing these things any other way. Anyway, the tone of this episode is then thoroughly wrecked by Jesus and Saru doing some therapeutic shouting. They have a big hug. They're surrounding Saru with positively lethal levels of emotion, are they really going to do the right thing and kill him off? I do hope so. Gay Doctor and Adira discover that Tignataro is missing, just as she's been for every episode in this season. This time though, they think it's suspicious. Saru and the President of Devar have a f feelings talk. Inside the sphere is a replica of a Federation starship, giving us strong childhood's end vibes again. It materializes one of those isolytic weapons morally dubious character used to destroy the first Death Star, and they figure out it's asking them why they destroyed it. 
and they reason that it must therefore not know that the Death Star is the Death Star and is destroying planets and that is all kinds of dumb, for reasons previously stated. Hyper-intelligent species my ass, they've made a galaxy-ending machine and they don't know how it works or what it does. Meanwhile, morally dubious character and diverse female space marine enact their ultimate plan. Back in the sphere, the dilemma is how to transmit the idea of us, as in the collective of people who are there. And Jesus, who else, figures out how to do that. Awesomest fighter, awesomest xenobiologist, awesomest pilot, awesomest person, awesomest counsellor, awesomest diplomat, and now very cunning and awesomest linguist as well. Happily, they discover that the collectors not only communicate with feelings, they have feelings, they have empathy. The show tells us this, it presents it as a revelation. But given we've already established that they communicate with feelings, how in the name of Moses on a Cartier dildo do the writers think this is news? You cannot communicate with feelings if you can't feel feelings. Why are you doing this? And then, morally dubious character's plan kicks in at the worst possible moment, the collectors sense the threat, they get angry, and they send everyone back to the Discovery, and then Book's ship disappears. Tignataro clearly forgot all her lines in this scene because the ADR here is abysmal. But I do have something that can help. But they concoct a plan to counter morally dubious character. They send a message back to the Discovery, warning them of what he is planning to do, and that sends Jesus into another spiral of terror. And that brings us to the, uh, well, the climactic final episode. Oh, such a shame. No more Star Trek Discovery. Whatever will we do with our time? How will we keep our moral compass properly set without such ethically magnetic beacons as Jesus, President Clinton, Admiral Forgettable, and Narnbread to guide us? How will we keep in touch with our feelings and emotions without weekly essays explaining exactly what feelings are, and why they're held, and how deeply they are felt? Those are questions for another time. For now, though, we must ask, how will Season 4 bring together all the plot and character threads that it hasn't dropped for unknown reasons in earlier episodes? How will this story of masterful incomprehensibility be brought to a fittingly incomprehensible end? Precisely how many seconds will it take for the Discovery crew to science their way out of this most implausible and chaotic of manufactured calamities? Well, it begins as ridiculously as you might expect. It turns out Federation headquarters can fly now. Oh, they fly now! They fly now! They fly now! It looks like a petrified sperm cell, and it can split into multiple petrified sperm cells, one of which is flying toward the Discovery, while others stay behind to mastermind the defense of Earth. And look who's been brought back for no discernible reason. It's Tilly. Remember how the show forgot she wanted to be a Starfleet captain, so dispatched her off to become a teacher? Well, for reasons I'm sure it won't bother to explain, it's decided that a teacher is best placed to play a prominent role in defending the Earth against the second Death Star, so she's back with us expositing the Federation's plans for an evacuation, exposition which, sure enough, finds time to contain a brief mention of feelings. They do a bit of a West Wing walk as she talks, stopping then so she can give her, uh, passionate peroration. But then they just use those instant personal teleporters to fuck off to wherever the plot needs them to be next, and you find yourself wondering, if they have these things, why, apart from as an excuse for exposition, do they do the West Wing walk at all? Why not just zap instantly to wherever it is they're supposed to be? Why does anyone walk anywhere in this show? I mean, Tilly needs the exercise, so that's a reason, but besides that, Admiral Forgettable explains that they only have four hours to save the world. The surly teenagers from the Hoth episode earlier in the series reappear in order to ask how many people they can hope to save, and it turns out they'll only be able to pick up some 450,000 people from Earth. Now you could set up a really interesting Battlestar Galactica-like fifth season if you have them fail to stop the Death Star, and turn the Collectors into villains, but this is Discovery and it's captained by Jesus, and there's absolutely no way Jesus can fail. Hell, we'll be lucky if anyone significant dies in this episode. Meanwhile, the Discovery is stuck in another space testicle, and the Collectors aren't returning their calls, while Book and morally dubious character head toward the Death Star's core. The Collectors try and capture Book's ship using the space testicles, and after revealing himself to be a genocidal maniac and beating Book up in the previous episode, morally dubious character finds that Book isn't inclined to help him escape them. Tignataro completely breaks the mood of the scene again with a joke about soup. Let's 
There's got to be a way out of this. If I had some hot and sour soup, wouldn't help us. I'm just hungry. Fucking soup. She says she'd quite like to die quickly and painlessly, which is a privilege she does not extend to any scene she's in. On the Discovery, Jesus and President Clinton explain to diverse female space marine that she has royally fucked things up, and she says, oh, and they say, yeah, and she says, yeah, that sucks, and they say, mm-hmm, and she says, I guess I'll help you guys now then, and they say, okay, and that's it. That is the extent of the recriminations handed out for a betrayal from a senior general that could potentially lead to tens of billions of people dying. That is the extent of the comeuppance she will suffer. Bear that in mind, it becomes relevant at the end. And here, less than 10 minutes in, is the episode's first big pile of steaming shit. Remember how we just spent what felt like hours on a ripoff of Arrival slash Close Encounters, the Discovery trying to communicate with the Collectors using feelings and figure out the light shows and all the rest? Well, it turns out all of that was unnecessary, because the president of Navarre remembers that she can mind meld, and only now does she decide that that might be worth a shot. And of course it instantly works. You know this because the windows go orange and she has some kind of prolonged orgasm, and this renders the entirety, the entirety, give or take a couple of scenes of the previous episode, a harrowing waste of our time. She can communicate through thoughts, they know the collectors do that. Did no one think to try it before spending implied hours trying to decode flashing lights and little bubbles of feeling? This show is full of plot holes, but this one is gaping so wide it is practically prolapsed. The collectors tell her they're confused and they're terrified, and they can't stop book ship, because despite being hyper-advanced aliens able to construct Death Stars, all they have at their disposal are water tentacles and space testicles. President of the VAR decides apparently that it isn't worth telling them anything useful in return because that would, once again, have solved a lot of problems the writers really need if they are to have any plot at all. Anyway, the orgasm was so powerful that it broke her mind and it puts her in medbay, where she gets to talk about feelings, and from feelings she has derived that the collectors are some kind of hive mind. She's left alone with Saru, so they can talk about their feelings. Meanwhile, Morally Jubia's character escapes the space testicles and makes it to the Death Star's core. Morally Jubia's character invites Book to go with him into the alternate dimension where he might find his planet and his family again. Tignataro ruins that proposition by saying that nobody in the alternate dimension will actually be them, which is an interesting philosophical quandary even moderately intelligent people can do a lot of thinking with. But Discovery isn't written by or for moderately intelligent people, and it has more important things to do than explore genuinely interesting philosophical quandaries because that's so old-fashioned. So morally dubious character says, yeah, but also no, it is them. Two beliefs that actually can't coexist, but they do here because the show needs to get on with things. Book says, no, they don't, mate, and he sides with Tig. The Discovery, meanwhile, has been stuck in a space testicle for quite some time, but gay scientist and Adira solve the problem off-screen, and then we get one of the obligatory minutes-long segments the show sets aside each episode for the characters to pretend to do a science. It turns out escaping the testicle is possible, but it will break the spore drive so they'll have to warp home, which of course could take them decades. But they don't have any other options, so they run with it. Book, meanwhile, decides that he can hack through the force field prison he's being held in using a- I'm actually- He decides- he just. Yep, yeah, no, that is actually what happens. He decides he can hack through the force field prison he's been thrown in using a cat toy. I, that's, that's a thing that the writers did. They have decided now that his cat hates holograms a lot, and so he has a thing on his wrist that lets him deactivate them. A cat door. Thank you later. And that, conveniently, also works on force fields. I mean, are we surprised? Are we surprised anymore? We shouldn't be surprised, but my god. My god. The Discovery breaks free of the testicle and the show decides it has a few pyrotechnics left in the garage, so we might as well have the bridge emit random bouts of flame. Tig and Book incapacitate Morally Dubia's character, but the ship is on autopilot now, and they can't change course or communicate with anyone. Doesn't Book have some kind of cat toy that can do that? 
Book gives Tig his badge so she can teleport back to the Discovery. Is there no range on these things, by the way? Tig arrives back on the Discovery and tells Jesus that Book says hi, with her customary passion and investment in the scene. President Clinton decides that a diverse female space marine is just the person to get them out of this mess, being the person who got them into it. But she's had a moral awakening now, so it's fine and we can trust her. Meanwhile, back at the Earth, we get the show's big climactic space battle. A big climactic space battle against... against rocks. Mm-hmm, that's right. The huge, dramatic final battle in this season is a big budget game of asteroids. What's a fucking joke? On Discovery, they decide the only way to stop Book's ship, because escaping the testicle knocked their weapons out for reasons of writerly convenience, is to ram a shuttle into it. David Bowie's sister volunteers, but the show needs to redeem diverse female space marines, so she gets to do it. You are Operation Get Behind the Darkies. You will follow Battalion 5 here, and try not to get killed for God's sake. Are there any questions, men? Yes, soldier. Have you ever heard of the Emancipation Proclamation? I don't listen to hip-hop. And it's not much, but at least we'll get one vaguely familiar character die in this episode, and that's something. Someone set asteroids on a particularly hard level, though, so Starfleet is having trouble in its hugely tense and dramatic fight against inanimate lumps of space rock. Admiral Forgettable decides it's time to end the evacuation effort and tells everyone to abandon their intergalactic sperm cell. Tilly and the creature feature rejects have a few seconds to talk about their feelings, and Tilly sends them away. Then Tilly and Admiral Forgettable remain to provide covering fire, which is absolutely something they couldn't have had the autopilot do because automated weapons don't exist in this universe, except that they do because morally dubious character has made them several times. But never mind, just invoke the second law of Star Trek Discovery and forget all past events that are inconvenient to the plot. If you missed our last installment, nobody knows what the first law is because they forgot that it was inconvenient to the plot. Book then has a very sincere feelings talk with morally dubious character, eliding another of the very interesting philosophical points this show is avoiding like the plague. Sure, maybe it's true to say that the people Book knew in this universe and who died would not be the same as the people in the alternate universe who didn't die, but in morally dubious character's case, his possible boyfriend left this universe to go to that one, in which case that rule doesn't apply, he is literally the same person. But this doesn't occur to morally dubious character, and he's finally persuaded by the strength of Book's feelings. And then they have a cry and they have a hug, and the morally dubious character decides to be a good boy after all. Unfortunately, it's a little bit late for that because he can't stop the ship. Not that he should want to, because the argument Book uses to convince him violates the setup of this quandary. Again, you can't convince morally dubious character that it's not worth crossing to another universe because nobody there would really be the people you've missed because they died here, because the person he misses here did not, probably, die here and he crossed into that universe, so he must be the same person. Even if you ignore all the interesting questions about what really separates people from their equivalents in other dimensions, this does not work. But it's cool because diverse female space marine arrives and Kamikaze's book ship. And that's a fitting end, I guess. Oh no, she's not dead. Fuck it, of course she isn't. They beamed her out at the last fraction of the last second. Why, show? Why do you do these things? You were on the cusp of giving this utterly forgettable character a reason to be remembered, to show she's a good person after all, committed and dutiful, prepared to sacrifice her life for her home. You could have redeemed her. This is good stuff. Why are you taking this away from her and us? And this bodes abysmally for the rest of the episode, because if the show can't bring itself to kill an ancillary character that no one really knows, it is hardly going to risk killing off anyone consequential, is it? Is it? I mean, maybe, but I, I doubt it. God damn it, that was pretty much the only reason I stuck it out this far. Why? And why does this happen so often in cinema and TV these days? Why can't good people die? Why do writers not think the audience could cope with anything even faintly resembling tragedy? Why is Gundam better written than Star Trek? They try and teleport Book back too, but they can't, and morally dubious character explains there is not enough power left for them to beam themselves back. Well, kind of. There's enough for one of them to go, and morally dubious character, who has had a complete character conversion and is now very good, decides that he will sacrifice himself because Book's life is in this world and his is in another or somewhere beyond that. 
Notwithstanding the philosophical problem already identified, this is almost a fitting send-off, but it is rather undermined by the fact they've tried to shove so much character development, two diametrically opposed ends, into one man in the space of little more than two episodes. Because none of this has been given the time it actually needs to settle, to actually make sense, it deprives morally dubious characters' end of any real weight or severity. We miss something we'd barely come to know, and to borrow a line of the quality this show so frequently deploys, it's hard to miss what you've never had. Again, this is a real shame, because there are all the ingredients of something compelling in his character, something impactful, something with emotional weight, but we barely get a whiff of that before it's all over. Discovery tries to get a lock on the transport signature from Book, but then the ship explodes and, and it goes. So, so we are getting a meaningful character death? Really? You're, you're not bringing him back? Well fucking done, show. Bold move. Please don't cock it up. The Collectors send another space testicle after them. Jesus exhausts her acting quota for this episode and immediately regains control of the ship, and we hard cut to the intergalactic sperm cell where Admiral Forgettable and Tilly have lost all their weapon systems so they sit down and have a drink and share some quirky humour at the end of all existence. It turns out they have two hours, though, before the Death Star itself arrives, and that is enough time for them to... talk about their feelings again. The intergalactic sperm cell is about as frustrated with this as all of us are, and it keeps trying to interrupt them by having bits of nothing explode behind them, but nothing can interrupt this show while it's having a feelings moment, so we get a long scene while Tilly and Admiral Forgettable share family history and their feelings about their family history, and generally fill in gaps competent writers would not have waited until the last five minutes of a season to reveal. Meanwhile, back on Discovery, it turns out the Collectors now understand the crew of the Discovery, they understand their feelings, and they offer to join forces. Which they do. They haven't called off the Death Star yet, though, because they don't understand them well enough. The argument might be that they haven't been told what it's doing yet, though this is nonsense because they should know what it's doing because they made it, and it takes a distinctly average human intelligence to figure out a connection between the Discovery's appearance and the fact their Death Star is blowing up planets, so hyper-intelligent space whales shouldn't have much trouble making the connection. But instead, they teleport the crew down to the crack of doom, where the CGI people have finally decided it's time to animate the Collectors, and they take the form of... How do you describe this? Jellyfish, as imagined by H.P. Lovecraft? The eldritch jellyfish ask what the crew are, again, and President Clinton explains they are all individuals who care about their feelings very much. Oh, stop it. Make it stop. Cringe is building to lethal levels, shields are down to 5%. They ask who Book was and what he did, because they sense the sadness, and Jesus has to try and explain love to the eldritch jellyfish, and also explain that the Death Star destroyed his planet, and that it's about to happen all over again. How do they not know this? Is it not their Death Star? The Eldritch Jellyfish say, we had no idea, we're sorry about that, and the Death Star just goes away, and then all the asteroids reverse and head away from the Earth, which you'd think would still endanger the intergalactic sperm cell and all the evacuation fleets, given they're now facing inanimate chunks of rock coming from the other fucking direction. Just shut up, don't, don't ask questions, just look at the pretty lights. Then Jesus and the Eldritch Jellyfish talk about their feelings. Because Jesus is still very sad about Book. And then, and then, something horrible happens. Something truly, truly, truly horrible. Please don't do this to me, show. Please don't do this, you did a good thing. Please don't do it, don't ruin it now. And they ruin it, because feelings ex machina strikes again and Book is back. Uh, I'm not sure I have the energy to put into words what a complete fucking letdown this is. The one, and I mean the one and only good decision this show has made. In four whole seasons, and they've just reversed it because feelings. What a waste of time. What a catastrophic mess. What nonsense this is. It is a pure, unmitigated, unadulterated catastrophe. My god. If Morally Dubious character's spirit is out there somewhere, by the way, I'd not blame him for coming back to haunt these people with a vengeance. The heavily implied love of his life is wiped from existence and rendered irrelevant because he disappeared into an alternate dimension, and that compels Morally Dubious character to martyr himself. 
even though the whole premise of his actions is that he can use the power of the Collectors to jump between dimensions, effectively making his entire plan and his death meaningless because he could have just asked them nicely. But then Jesus gets book back because I mean, there, just, there aren't any reasons really, but what reasons does the show give? Well, apparently the Collectors noticed a strange signal just before book ship blew up and they captured it and kept it around in case it turned out to be important for some reason. These phantasmic space monks, who completely ignored the discovery when it entered their hyperfield, an actual spaceship from another galaxy, because they just weren't that bothered, were bothered enough by a random signal that they just scooped it up and kept it in a jar in case it turned out to be a thing, and then they popped the lid out of that jar and out popped book. That is literally what just happened. That is the kind of writing we are dealing with here. It boggles the mind. The only reason it didn't boggle the writers' minds is because they don't have minds to be boggled, just some weird semi-sentient dopamine-filled goop where their brain should be. And it just goes on and on and on. The reason they sent their Death Star tearing up the galaxy is because they didn't realize anyone, anyone at all, in a whole galaxy, was a higher life form despite the eldritch jellyfish having been higher life forms themselves at one stage, and being so much more advanced now even than that. Despite them having the ability to control said Death Star as it moves around the galaxy, and so by definition having knowledge of that galaxy and the ability to see into it. Despite the fact that the much less advanced crew of the Discovery were able to sense the Collector's presence from the other side of that galaxy. Despite them having built a galactic hyperfield, to protect themselves from that galaxy. Despite, despite, despite and despite again, this entire season has happened because the writers took a hyper-intelligent species and gave them all the intelligence of a cucumber. They promised that, in the future, they'll scan more broadly, proving that they have the ability to know about intelligent life in the galaxy and they just didn't bother. It's literally just, sorry mate, we didn't see you there. What? kind of super advanced spasmonoids are these? How did anyone think this made sense? They promised to only send the Death Star to uninhabited areas in future, but Book says that's not good enough because they have to stop destroying lives. They just said uninhabited, you brain-dead moose. They say they can't completely power down the Death Star though because without it they wouldn't be able to keep their hyperfield active and that would make them unsafe which gives the show an opportunity to start its injection of modern- I say start, they've been doing it all along- to inject modern democratic political messaging. Having Book say, hiding behind a wall won't keep you safe. I don't know man, they've been pretty safe until now. In fact, they were unassailably safe and powerful until they let you in. Your very presence here, everything that's just happened- is proof that they were very much right to build their wall and they really shouldn't have let anyone through it. Masterful work from the writers as ever, striving to make a very unsubtle political point and inadvertently proving the Republicans right. Book tells them about a tree on his planet and the tree had feelings, and this is a moral lesson. But I guess he gets his closure and you can tell that because his forehead flashes up with a notification message telling him he's completed the quest. The Collectors say they're very sorry and they won't do it again. The end. It, it is the end, right? Please, please let it be the end. No, no, it's not. There's 15 minutes left. Tilly and Admiral Forgettable do shots on the intergalactic sperm cell. The crew goes back to the Discovery, the hyperfield evaporates and the Collectors open a wormhole. Hyper-advanced species that doesn't know what intelligent life is or how to communicate or what its technology does can still summon a wormhole. And that lets the Discovery go home which I'm pretty sure they've just nicked from the end of Star Trek Voyager. Apparently Titan got pretty messed up by the Death Star, but everyone's coming together to rebuild it. Tilly reunites with Jesus. Everyone laughs and drinks and is merry. President Clinton and Admiral Forgettable have a moment. Tilly and Adira talk about their feelings, because they're probably the only two characters in this show who have not had a chance to do this with each other yet. More drinking, more laughing, Saru and the President of Navarre, talk about their feelings, and finally they decide to hook up. Yay! I, I don't want to know how that works. You don't want to know how that works. If you are the kind of sick weirdo who wants to know how that works, there is probably hentai of it somewhere. Jesus and President Clinton talk about their feelings, and then what happens to Burke, who has broken a lot of laws. Then again, 
Jesus breaks laws all the goddamn time and she never faces any repercussions. But he's done many bad things. Kind of. Maybe. Potentially? And yet, we can't help but note that everything worked out just fine and dandy, and this is usually all the excuse necessary to forgive Jesus her innumerable sins against societal order and harmony. We also can't help but remember that diverse female space marine committed treason and almost blew up the galaxy, but she did a kamikaze and survived, and has faced no consequences at all. The motive for Book's actions was much stronger than hers and more explicable, and his actions in the end helped save the galaxy, but he's going to be punished? Then again, Book is not Jesus, he is a mere disciple. He is also an important character and not a mere plot device, and so there must be consequences. He must be punished. Punished with... Punished with community service? That's... That's it. That's the punishment. He has to go and help people affected by the Death Star. This show truly has a modern progressive attitude to justice, in that it really doesn't believe in justice at all and simply doles out punishment based on how fashionable the perpetrator happens to be at the given moment. It didn't try to explain why books shouldn't be allowed to get away with the kind of thing Jesus does all the time, or the thing diverse female space marine got away with for no reason, and seems stubbornly set in the belief that he has committed grave wrongs, which of course he has. He was almost complicit in the ending of the entire galaxy at the hands of a machine that was, well actually that was already ending the galaxy, someone remind me what the stakes were supposed to be? But having been so stubbornly set in its ways, it then decides that restorative non-justice is the most fitting penance he can be made to pay. Community service. This is like the Empire capturing Luke Skywalker and sentencing him to mop up graffiti on Corellia. Star Trek Discovery took a far harsher line with the owner of an actual prison that housed actual murderers and hardened criminals. For some reason, being sent on community service, though, means that he and Jesus have to say goodbye. They talk about their feelings and how much they love each other, and they go on and on and on about it, reminiscing about things in past episodes we thought we'd been allowed to forget. And then he gets up to way. I'm not sure why Jesus can't go visit him, why this has to be the final goodbye they're pretending that it is, but there we are. I guess she'll just be too busy. It would be odd if this were his final departure from the show, given it has at least one more season left to run. Perhaps the most significant subplot running throughout this series concerned his relationship with Burnham, and to the extent there were any improvements at all in her character, they were almost all his doing. A character with imperfections, trials, trauma and tribulations was a necessary foil to her interminable, insufferable perfection. David Ajala's ability to act beyond the level of a grade school play put on by the special needs class bought us what little relief we had from otherwise relentless badness. But having established the two as being ultimately inseparable, the show seems now to have decided to separate them. His absence from any fifth season would be felt by fans if there were any fans to feel it, but there's no guarantee it would be felt by the series itself because it has no understanding of things like character and relationships for all it preaches about love, and it tends to shed as much of the baggage of its earlier seasons as possible when it begins a new run. Jesus gives us a closing monologue, which manages to take what little there was that was serious and impactful about what we've just seen, precious little of it I know, and turn it into a sloppy blurb. It really does feel like an ending, not only the ending of a season, but the end of a series. Maybe they wrote this before they knew they were getting it renewed. But hell, we've come to the end- no. No. What's this? It's not over yet? Again? Another false ending? A president of the United Earth has arrived. Who, who is it? No. No fucking way. No absolute, what the, f no, uh, no, Stacy, what? Stacy Abrams? Stacy, wrong clip, sorry. Stacy Abrams, no, that's still not the right clip. Stacy Abrams gets a cameo? Stacy Abrams is, the Stacy Abrams is president of Earth. She won an election. Well, we have to assume she did. More likely she lost, but just declared herself president anyway, and everyone was just kind of polite and went along with it. This, oh uh, no, and I resent it because it requires more words, and it means this video is going to have to be even longer. And it also requires that we get a bit more serious again, because the more you think about it, the more this really is an overt attack on what Star Trek was, what it's supposed to be, on its ideals, on its approach on its moral philosophy, 
on everything about it, and I shall now proceed to explain to you why. From being simply a bad show, Star Trek Discovery has now leveled possibly the biggest insult it's possible to make against its own legacy, and that of Gene Roddenberry, and the philosophy and the values that once made Star Trek what it is. Or now, I suppose we have to say, what it was. Up until this point, Star Trek Discovery has been something of a joke. It's been parodically bad. It's as though it's been invented by somebody on the political right to caricature somebody on the woke left. The fact it's been sincerely created by people on the woke left is just farcical. Why the hell would you give your opponents this kind of ammunition? To that end, Discovery serves quite a useful purpose. Whenever people try and tell you that woke is just a lazy insult, that it's nebulous and ill-defined, that it's just a thoughtless slur deployed by idiots on the right to oppose basic common sense issues of justice and equality, you can point them to Star Trek Discovery and say, my friend, you seem to be misinformed. But so overt has it been, so comically unsubtle, so brazen in its desire to hit every fashionable issue, every vogue message, every thought-free high-status opinion, that it's actually been kind of harmless as a tool for the purposes its writers intended it to meet. The only people who take it seriously are people who didn't need another TV show to tell them what to think, either because they already think it or, more likely, because they don't think in the first place. But as a propaganda piece, it's been entirely ineffective. The only minds it's changed are those of people who might once have been flirting with its ideology, but have been sent scurrying to the toilet to throw up now they've finally seen what it entails. The show lacks the subtlety to work as propaganda. It's so convinced of its rightness that it fails to convince anyone else who doesn't already agree with it. What it has damaged, of course, is the existing fanbase and the integrity of the franchise. It didn't kill Star Trek. Star Trek was already dead, as we've said which is the only reason Star Trek Discovery came to be. But it has abused, and is still abusing, the zombified husk that remains, turning it against the very ideals that once animated it. We've covered some of this in other videos. The fundamental difference between New Trek and Old Trek maps a fundamental change in the nature and character of progressivism, turning it from something universal to something that is not only particular, but avowedly factional. And Stacey Abrams' cameo takes that to a whole new level. I've said many times that Star Trek has always been political in a sense, and it has always sat on a particularly progressive wing. But those defending this cameo on the grounds that Trek has always been political mean the word political in a different sense to the one I'm using. Old Trek commented on current political issues by abstracting them, elevating them to questions of basic values, themes, philosophies, to the extent it was political, its goal was to improve our politics, to transcend our politics, to transcend very bitter and very real factional arguments by speaking to what each of us, Republican or Democrat, liberal, left-wing or conservative, have in common. Ultrek's goal was always to assert our common humanity. In the original series, that goal was particularly pressing, coming as it did at a hinge point in history. An old American order was on its way out, the after-effects of the Civil War were finally at their end stage. Within a single century, America had been founded in rebellion, had split in rebellion, and had come back together. One of the major causes of the Second Rebellion, the questions of race and slavery, was not unique to America. Anyone who tells you racism and slavery is a uniquely American sin is lying to you. But the struggle with it was unique to America. People like to think that history, to the extent it matters at all, could have been, even would have been, perfect were it not for the presence of some evil group or ideology. Man is born free, but is everywhere in chains. They like you to think that all the grubby, sordid sins of our past can now be swept away, because we know who that evil group is and what ideology they have. So if we simply revolt against them, excise them, liquidate them as a class, we can attain paradise. Of course, you and I know this is nonsense. Man is not perfectible and the past is not alterable. Sin is not heritable and old wrongs cannot be erased at the stroke of a pen. What's remarkable about America is not that it took a century to transcend slavery and racism, but that it only took a century for it to do so. Old Trek came about at a time when the last vestiges of that old order were being swept away. 
what began as indentured servitude and morphed into American slavery, funnily enough because a black man just decided not to release one of his own indentured servants, the fact that the first American slave owner was himself a black man, is one of those facts a little bit too inconvenient for modern history textbooks to stress. Anyway, it had, by the time the original series aired, reached the point of civil rights and integration. It's absolutely right and proper and important that we condemn what went before it, Jim Crow and segregation. But a proper, if unpalatable, reading of history is that these were actually signs of progress, not regress. You'll have to bear with me on this, it doesn't sound as bad as I just made it sound, trust me. Because that society had gone from accepting slavery to accepting separate but equal was actually a sign that that society had been forced to accept a very important premise, that all men, as the constitution states, are free and created equal. And that would eventually and inexorably lead to desegregation and equality before the law. The original series of Star Trek featured an interracial kiss at a time when the civil rights movement was hotly disputed and often resisted, when we didn't argue about the merits of affirmative action, but rather whether black people should be allowed to attend white schools. But this was progress when you compare it with what happened previously. If you're debating what equality means as opposed to whether slavery is good or not, or even whether slavery made economic sense, which was a preceding argument, then the question of equality is progress, no matter what bad forms that question might give rise to, and Jim Crow was, unquestionably, a terrible answer to that question. In the place of the old order, a new, different, and foreign order was rising. The original series of Star Trek debuted within a decade of Nikita Khrushchev's infamous We Will Bury You speech, within two decades of Churchill's declaration that an iron curtain had descended across Europe. The original series featured Japanese helmsmen, within living memory of internment and Pearl Harbor and the Second World War, and a Russian navigator at a time of red scares, McCarthyism, global communism, Vietnam, the Bay of Pigs, the Cuban Missile Crisis, and the very real prospect of nuclear annihilation at the hands of Soviet Russia. Old Trek navigated all of these great divides with a skill and a sensitivity and a deafness we've not really been able to match since. Yes, sometimes it was full of itself, Yes, as it progressed, it was often a little too self-satisfied, too taken with its own value set. I'll risk offending Trekkies, I'm sure, in our audience by saying that the next generation, and particularly Voyager, were prone to what you might call liberal triumphalism. But even then, they managed to avoid, to the best of my knowledge at least, becoming political in the other sense, in the sense that the defenders of Star Trek Discovery are using the term today. Old Trek was never party political. Seldom, if ever, was it concerned with policy questions, and, to the best of my knowledge, it never endorsed a present-day political figure's campaign for high office. I think I've seen somebody mention that it once featured President Lincoln in a favorable light, omitting the fact that Lincoln had been dead for quite a few years by that point and was not presently running for high office in Georgia. The fact Old Trek was universalist in its approach made its progressivism universalist too, because believe it or not, there was a time when it was possible to talk of conservative progressives or liberal progressives, left-wing progressives, Republican progressives. Yes, it made enemies of unreconstructed racists in the South because they disputed its moral premise, that premise of universalism. But even back in the 1960s, the majority of Americans did not dispute that moral premise in any serious way. A great many people were prejudiced, but their prejudices were never particularly ideological seldom were they thought through. Often they were held loosely, just because they were familiar, yet held by people who were in all other respects opposed to the kind of violent bigotry the country had so rapidly moved away from. Old Trek defeated this unstated contradiction by simply stating it. Its message was not, you should support Malcolm X. It wasn't even that you should support Martin Luther King. Rather, it visualized our ideals and played them back to us, leaving it to us to ask why our ideals didn't match our reality, and thereby inviting us to consider how we might change that. For instance, having accepted the premise, as most by then had, that all men are indeed free and created equal, why is it that our state or states did not embody that principle? Having accepted that there are morals and values common to all humanity, and that beneath ideologies are people who could be our friends and our neighbors, Why did we continue to act as if people are defined by the ideologies of their governments? Sometimes this was naive, simplistic even, but it was always hopeful. Its underlying assumption was that that hope was itself a human universal. 
If it wasn't everywhere and always correct, it was right enough. This universalism is why Old Trek is so fondly remembered now by people of all political and party affiliations. Our previous Star Trek videos have combined in the tens of thousands of views now, and they've accrued thousands of comments. The people kind enough to leave comments come from every walk of life and have voted for pretty much every political party that's out there. I've chatted to Republicans, Democrats, Libertarians, Conservatives, Socialists, Religious People, Atheists, Agnostics, Christians, Muslims, Americans, Australians, Germans, Iranians, and I take this as proof of what I've just laid out. Because these various peoples believe some very, very different things about the world, about religion, about politics. But each of them agree on the values of Old Trek and the value of Old Trek. And by and large, they all agree that New Trek does not embody these things, to its shame. We've explored in previous videos the ways in which Discovery and Picard in particular have diverged from the themes, the values, and the approach of Old Star Trek. There are many particular examples, but the general point is this. New Trek has abandoned the progressive or liberal universalism of its forebears in favor of a politically specific, factional, exclusionary, and even a campaigning approach that now includes a direct political endorsement of a present-day candidate for high office in the United States. That it is factional and exclusionary can be seen from the arguments deployed in defense of Stacey Abrams' cameo, the least subtle of which simply celebrate the fact that it's pissing off all the right people. Some are solely satisfied with the joy of pissing off Republicans, assuming wrongly that Republicans are the only people pissed off by it. Once again, our comment sections are disproof of this incredibly shallow and short-sighted assumption. Speaking for myself, and indeed I think speaking for our channel, I can say that though neither of us at the Little Platoon are American, and neither of us has or has ever had a vote in the United States, if we did, it's not likely that we would be Republican voters. The only thing more ridiculous than that suggestion is that we be Democrat voters. Yet we on this channel, and I think I can say most of the people in our comment section as well, are pissed off by this cameo. And we're not Republicans, in case you missed that point. And I think a lot more people would be pissed off if they understood what it is and what it represents, because it's not just a casual cameo. It's a specific political statement and an endorsement of a specific candidate. And that candidate embodies the antithesis of the kind of liberal universalism that Old Trek espoused. In fact, Stacey Abrams is a very handy representative of the change in the character of progressivism that has taken place in recent years, which, broadly, is the ascendancy of the political left wing over the old liberal wing. And I mean liberal in the correct sense, which is to say, not the way Americans use the term. One of the reasons your politics is so fucked, Americans, is that you folks tend to call liberals conservatives and socialists, even communists, liberals, and this makes no sense whatsoever. There are reasons for this that you can trace back to the political campaigns of Teddy Roosevelt, but given this video is already quite long enough, we'll not go into them here. But we do have to say something about Stacey Abrams, given Star Trek Discovery has just endorsed her for president of the fucking planet. Regular viewers of our channel will know that we have two broad sections of content, Critique, of which this video is a part, which looks at film and TV and other aspects of culture, and our sometimes daily podcast which focuses on politics and current events. Now, I'm with George Orwell in saying that you cannot separate art and politics. As he put it, the opinion that art should have nothing to do with politics is itself a political attitude. But as much as possible, I've tried to keep a divide between these two sections. The politics of art is interesting and often it's informative, especially when we're discussing how shows like Star Trek Discovery are created, what motivates their writers, what they are designed to achieve. But there is more to art than politics, and I think, I hope anyway, that the rest of this review is proof that we're interested at least as much in all art's many other aspects too. One of the reasons I have to resent Stacey Abrams' cameo is that it makes it impossible to maintain even the pretense of a Jeffersonian wall between art and politics. Some of the defenders of her cameo seem to think that Stacey Abrams actually represents the values of old Trek. She is not merely a political campaigner, and the causes she espouses are not merely questions of policy. Rather, she speaks the kind of truths Old Trek espoused. Her utterance is evaluative in the same way. What she advocates is just as universalist. Therefore, her cameo is in perfect continuity with the themes, the philosophy of Old Trek. None of this is true. If a show that aspired to any kind of mainstream audience gave a public endorsement of Ron DeSantis in this way, these same people would lose their shit, and rightly so. This video is not going to debate the merits of Ron DeSantis, his policies, or his governorship. 
Some of you will like him and some of you won't. Our opinion isn't relevant to this video, however, except to say that, again, without making any kind of value judgment on his policies or whatever else, it would be absurd to say that Ron DeSantis embodies the values of Old Trek, or that his beliefs are the same as its, or that his advocacy takes the same approach that it did. Ron DeSantis is a political figure. Ron DeSantis has an ideology. Ron DeSantis talks about, debates, and argues for specific policy responses to contentious political issues against people who do the same. Whether you like him or not, he is, by definition, he's a politician after all, a divisive figure, and it would be nonsense to pretend that he isn't, even if you agree with him. The same is true of Stacey Abrams. Stacey Abrams is a divisive figure. Stacey Abrams has played and continues to play on division in order to advance her political causes and interests and her political career. She has spoken demonstrable untruths, actually, let's call it straight, she has demonstrably fucking lied to further her interests and lied in such a way as to entrench political and racial divisions, not to overcome them. She campaigned, and she still campaigns, on the claim that the state of Georgia deliberately suppressed the black vote in 2018, and indeed before and after that, and that this is the reason she lost her election. Which of course she didn't actually lose, remember, because she claimed at the time, and I think she still claims, that she actually won that election, leaving us to question whether she actually is president of Earth in Star Trek Discovery, or whether she simply claimed she was and everybody went along with it. At any rate, she refused to concede. People, quite rightly, abhor Donald Trump's refusal to concede the 2020 presidential election, believing it, I'd say, with qualifications rightly, to be a profound and dangerous break with the bonds of trust that must exist if any democratic system is to survive. Voter irregularities, which have always existed, in every election, it's always worth trying to count the number of dead Chinese people who voted every time a Clinton is on the ballot, have to be truly astonishing in scale to justify the course of action Donald Trump took following that election. The evidence he was able to produce did not, in my opinion, justify his contention that the election was stolen. We can argue about the specifics, and we can also argue about what is in my view a more serious and more valid claim, about other broader ways in which that election was, shall we say, less than honourable, in particular the roles of American mass media and the major tech companies in suppressing the truth on the nebulous grounds that the truth is in fact disinformation, but that is for another time. Of Ms. Abrams, however, her claims were flatly untrue. It's been astonishing to witness the very people who supported her and her refusal to concede the election then go on to condemn Donald Trump for doing exactly the same thing. The specific law with which she took umbrage, which sought to impose voter ID requirements, amongst other things, for state elections, introduced measures which are less strict and less severe than the laws already in place in predominantly democratic states like New Jersey. She and her supporters in high places, including the current President of the United States, made claims about that law that were so brazenly untrue even the Washington Post fact-checkers noticed and were compelled to give them four Pinocchios for claims like the law cut off voting after 5pm and prohibited the handing out of bottles of water to people waiting in line for hours to vote. It did no such thing. Stacey Abrams claimed that the state government had deliberately purged black people from voting rolls before the election, despite this being an automatic process in place for many years that kicks in in almost every state at set time intervals, for no reason more sinister than ensuring the state has up-to-date information about those who live there and those who no longer do. She has claimed that similar laws are enacted across the United States with the express purpose of suppressing the black vote because racism. Now I've no doubt this is true in some specific instances, but if it were a general truth, then the sinister forces trying to suppress the black vote because racism are doing a pretty poor job of it, given that blacks across the United States are so often overrepresented in voting rolls versus their share of the population, including in the state of Georgia, where new voter registrations in both 2016 and 2020 were disproportionately black voters. And if the state of Georgia were attempting to suppress the black vote as she claimed, then Stacey Abrams has to explain why it is that the state has had no excuse absentee voting for 15 years, widely available early voting for more than 12, and why it adopted automatic registration in 2016, making registering to vote the default option when people, say, get a driver's license, a change, by the way, introduced by Brian Kemp, the man she was campaigning against. Stacey Abrams cited the closure of polling places and seemed to imply that this was the doing of the state and specifically of Mr. Kemp. 
The truth is that these decisions were made by local districts and councils, many if not most of which were predominantly Democrat controlled, and several of these decisions were made against the express wishes of Mr. Kemp. Many of these decisions were made because the councils and districts needed to cut costs, something Stacey Abrams should be familiar with, given that she herself had previously voted to cut the number of days allocated for early voting on cost grounds, therefore by her own argument making her guilty of voter suppression and a racist. In a bid to legitimize her falsehoods, Abrams, like a great many politicians, particularly it must be said Democrats, sought to play up racial tension and division not to overcome it. She claimed, and still claims, that the non-existent voter suppression in states like Georgia amounts to a system that is at least as bad as Jim Crow and in certain ways worse than Jim Crow. Like now President Biden's hysterical claim that Mitt Romney, Mitt fucking Romney, milquetoast Mitt himself, wanted to put black people back in chains, this is a conscious decision by Abrams to stoke racial fear and animosity. This kind of extraordinary claim requires extraordinary evidence to justify it. But not only does Abrams have no extraordinary evidence, she has no evidence at all. In fact, she frequently boasts of how she increased turnout among black and minority voters in 2018, a claim that, shall we say, doesn't really sit that easily with her simultaneous claim that the vote in Georgia is being brutally suppressed a la Jim Crow, making this a loathsome, contemptible, hucksterish thing to say, and something that people of all party affiliations and political beliefs should have no trouble at all condemning. We all condemned Donald Trump for claiming he couldn't get a fair hearing in a court because the judge was Mexican, and a great many of us didn't like his comments about Mexican rapists and drug runners. Yet all of these claims had more by way of supporting evidence than Abrams has been able to produce for hers. I could go on, but I think I've probably snapped your patience by now or at least severely tested it. Maybe you've already switched off, and if you have though, I'm going to say that this is because of viewer suppression, because big tech is racist against me, and actually I won YouTube. I'll simply round off this portion of the review by saying that if Star Trek Discovery had any respect at all for the morals, values, and lessons of old Trek, or any regard at all for its approach to politics and questions of social justice, I'd not have had to write this portion of the review. Star Trek Discovery had already discarded most of these lessons, but Stacey Abrams' cameo means that we can't be charitable about the reasons why. We can't ascribe it to innocent stupidity or ignorance of the law. We can't claim it was the result of thoughtlessness on the part of the writers. No, that's now impossible. Stacey Abrams' cameo proves that all of this has been a conscious decision, a deliberate decision, designed not to forget the past, but to repudiate. Discovery has just endorsed a modern politician for office, for high office, even for the highest office in the land. A franchise that was once able to straddle both sides in the Cold War has been reduced to a campaigning tool in the culture wars. A franchise that helped to see beyond capitalism and communism now cannot see past the radical wing of the Democrat Party. A franchise that once aspired to universalism now thinks that anyone who votes the wrong way and anyone who values honesty in politics and anyone who values truth has no place in its vision for our anointed future. And that is truly contemptible. Hello again, it's present tense me. The past is, as they say, a foreign country. They edit videos very differently there. We've reached the end of the original script for this video. There was an outro, but it was rather tedious, and I think I was a bit drunk, so I'll spare you all of that. It wasn't much more than a recap, followed by a short essay on the pyramid scheme that is the streaming service economy that I'm pretty sure I've put several different ways in several different mediums since. I wouldn't want to repeat myself. We've left Star Trek in a pretty terrible place, I think we can all agree. We can be reasonably sure it's going to get a lot worse, not least since Discovery has somehow landed itself with a fifth season and Patrick Stewart is about to be wheeled out to dribble over the script of Picard Season 3. Some people seem to believe this one will be much better than Season 2. I dare say most fans remain mm, unconvinced. Will you watch them? That is entirely up to you. Will I watch them? Ah, uh, I couldn't say. I was never the biggest Trekkie, but if New Trek has left any lasting mark on me, it's this. I no longer give a shit. And that's it. The next video is going to cover Avatar The Last Smurf Bender. That's going to be a long one, and I really need to get back to work on it. So, I'll see you next time.